So welcome everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Dr. Becky Faith. I'm from the Institute of Development Studies and I'll be uh, moderating and hosting this webinar. So just to introduce the subject, there's a lot of interest in leveraging mobile phone technology to change health and nutrition related behaviours in low income countries, but there's still a lack of rigorous evidence on the impact of these interventions. The M Nutrition Initiative was a mobile phone based advisory service to scale up the delivery of nutrition and agriculture information in 12 countries throughout Sub Saharan Africa and South Asia. The service aimed to promote behaviour change around key nutrition practices and farming decisions to contribute to improved nutritional health within poor households. Nutrition services were supported by the UK's Department for International Development, DFID, between 2013 and 2019 were organised by GSMA and implemented by in-country mobile network operators and other service providers. DFID commissioned an external impact evaluation to look at the effectiveness and commercial viability of M Nutrition in two countries, Ghana and Tanzania. Uh, in this webinar, the lead researchers from the researchers from the M Nutrition evaluation team are going to present findings and lessons learned from the recently completed M Health evaluation in Tanzania. Uh, so I'll just run quickly through the agenda and a bit of housekeeping and then we'll get started. Um, Dr Inka Barnett from the Institute of Development Studies will be giving an overview of the M Nutrition Services and the evaluation design. Dr Giardano Poloni from the from IFPRI will be looking at um, how designing and implementing mobile phone information services to change behaviours. And then Dr Nigel Scott from GAMOS will be looking at exploring how to building a commercially viable business model for mobile phone based information services. We'd love to have your questions. Please type your questions in the chat box, not in the Q&A box. And what we're going to do is gather those questions in and then sort them and then we'll have a, a Q&A session after all the presentations. So I just need to run through some housekeeping. We are recording this webinar and we'll be sharing the recording on the M Nutrition project page which I urge you to look at. It's uh, bit.ly slash M Nutrition Ev, one word. Uh, so if you do have a question as I said please put it in the chat box, we'll be doing those afterwards. Please I urge you to keep your microphone muted um, and then join by audio rather than by video, although I think we will be doing all the questions via chat. Uh, and then if you have any technical issues, please email my colleague Sophie, that's s.marsden, M-A-R-S-D-E-N, at ids.ac.uk. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr Inka Barnett, to take you through um, her presentation. Over to you, Inka. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would like to start by explaining a little bit more what M Nutrition is and how it worked. So it's a global mobile phone based service that uses SMS or so recorded voice messages or also call center to scale up the delivery of nutrition and health and also agricultural information and to promote actively behavior change around key infant and um, young child feeding practices and behaviors and also farming decisions with the ultimate aim of improving the nutritional health within a household. The content, so the nutrition messages for M Nutrition was developed by GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition with partners and then adapted to local context and delivered via existing M Health or M Agri platforms. The focus of today's webinar is the evaluation we did in Tanzania and here with M Nutrition delivered via an existing M Health platform called Vazazi Nipendeni. We also did an evaluation of an agriculture platform, Vodafone Pharma Club in in Ghana, but the focus of today's webinar is on Vasazi Nepindeni plus M Nutrition in Tanzania. 
we, um, to explain a little bit more what Wazazi Nependeni is, Wazazi Nependeni is an existing SMS based program, Healthy Pregnancy, Healthy Baby program that delivered SMS or delivers SMS messages in Swahili to reduce maternal and infant mortality in Tanzania. M Nutrition added around 120 SMS messages specifically focused on nutrition and here infant and young child feeding practices and behaviors to the existing Vazazi Nependeni service. The, the messages that caregivers and mothers in particular received were specifically tailored towards the stage um, in pregnancy or in early childhood um, of the person who subscribed to the service. Also really important to remember is that Vazazi Nependeni plus M Nutrition was not a standalone service, but closely interlinked with government services and also actively um, promoted the uptake of maternal and child health services. Um, Vazazi Nependeni is a national level program rolled out um, throughout Tanzania. So it's not a small pilot project, um, but a national level program. For the external inter impact evaluation, we used a mixed method design consisting of three components. We did a qualitative evaluation, including three qualitative data collection round and quantitative experimental design and here an RCT. And for the business component, we drew on different data streams and did multiple data collection rounds. The overall aim of the evaluation was to assess the effectiveness of Vazazi Nependeni plus M Nutrition and also the commercial viability of the mobile phone based services in reaching poor households and improving their nutritional knowledge and behaviors and here in particular um, infant and young child feeding behaviors. It's also important to remember that M Nutrition is a global initiative that was rolled out across 12 different countries in Sub-Sahara Africa and South Asia. And the findings um, from our impact evaluation of Tanzania and Ghana, of course, don't reflect on the performance of M Nutrition in general. In the next few minutes, we would like to share our findings and also the lessons learned of how to design and implement a mobile phone based information service to change infant and young child feeding behaviors and, pract and practices. In particular, we want to look at how to increase the reach and the uptake of mobile phone based services to improve infant and young child feeding behaviors how um, the effectiveness of mobile phone based services in changing behaviors can be increased and also what strategies work best for designing engaging content of mobile phone based services. Over to Giordano. Hi everyone. Uh, so I get to start presenting some of the results from the uh, fabulous household survey based fieldwork. Uh, which many of you who are attending were actually involved with. So thank you for your help in facilitating this. Um, so this is just a, a chart showing exposure, self-reported exposure to the M nutrition treatment during our study period, which lasted from late 2016 to late 2018, so over a two-year period. So this is showing treatment households. So of the 1,277 treatment households that we, we were able to contact during our inline survey, about 67 or 66 percent reported that they received some nutrition-based SMS messages during the study period. That means that about 34 percent reported not receiving these messages. I think you should bear, you should, you should have, well, bear in mind there are some caveats to these results because we were asking about a relatively long study period, so two years, and it's entirely possible that a lot of households didn't remember, for example, receiving some nutrition-based messaging early on during the study period. Um, some evidence of this you can see if you look at some of the, at the two smaller boxes on the right. So 44% of the treatment households reported receiving content from the M Nutrition program. That is, they were, they were able to identify the phone number from which they received the content as being the M Nutrition phone number. 
but another 26% reported that they received nutrition-based SMS messages and they were unable to identify the source. This suggests that a lot of these households were actually receiving the mNutrition content and they just didn't know that they were receiving it from that phone number or from the mNutrition program. Um, we can see also that if we compare to the, to the control group, only 12% of control households similarly identified receiving nutrition content from an unknown number. One of the more critical pieces of information that we can get out of this chart uh, is that there were large differences in exposure to nutrition messaging between our treatment and control group. So about 40 percentage points difference based on the self-reported measures, okay? This is a lower take-up gap than we would have expected, than we, than we had hoped for, but it's still quite large. Some reasons to think that this gap might underestimate the true difference in being exposed are that we have some administrative data that was shared with us from early on during the study period that suggested about 85, well, sorry, at least 85% of the treatment households were receiving content at that time. So if we take that as our lower estimate or lower bound estimate of the exposure among treatment households, it would suggest that the take-up gap is actually larger than we're finding when we use the self-reported data. Uh, some issues that could be affecting these, this reporting is our low message salience. So for example, if households are receiving the content, but they don't know who it's from, um, in an extreme circumstance, they could be receiving messages and confusing it with spam, for example. Uh, unequal mobile phone access across household members. So a lot of these households may have had one mobile phone and we may have been attempting to contact, for example, the mother of a young child, but the mobile phone may have been primarily used by the male. So the, in that case, the female may not have reported receiving the content. Back to you, Inka. Thanks, Gio. So what factors affect the reach and the sustained uptake of mobile phone-based services? We found in Tanzania, but similar was found in Ghana, uh, that especially poor households and women were often excluded from accessing and using the mobile phone-based service. This was the, ma the main reason for this was um, access and ownership to a mobile phone, especially we found in Tanzania gendered barriers to accessing the mobile phone. So even if a household had a mobile phone, the, the women or in particular the mothers were often not able to access the mobile phone because the access was strictly controlled by the owner of the mobile phone or the owner of the mobile phone traveled or was absent of the household um, a lot of the time. So women couldn't actually access the SMS um, based information regularly. Other um, uh, reasons for poor reach and just um, poor uptake were um, lack of um, available supportive infrastructure and here uh, limited network coverage still posed a problem in many areas, difficult access to electricity, which meant that the mobile phone was often switched off for long periods of time and consequently SMS messages with information were missed. And also the practice of using multiple SIM cards um, that had to be manually exchanged and which often meant that the SIM card that was used to subscribe to the service was not actually in the mobile phone and this way messages with information were missed. Then capacity of the user, of course, illiteracy was a problem for SMS-based information. In Ghana, the information was actually delivered via voice messages to address this particular challenge. But here we found that there were quite a lot of issues with accessing recorded voice messages because there were a lot of misconceptions of um, what voice messages are, whether people have to pay for it or not. So there were lots of issues around this. Then there were some challenges with the implementation and in particular fluctuation in the service delivery. So some households said they haven't received any message for several weeks and then the messages started again. Um, also, Vazazi Nepindeni was delivered via different MNOs and the frequency of delivery of, of the messages seemed to, at least based on the qualitative data, vary a little bit. So subscribers with different networks receive different frequency of um, messages. 
Then um, there were also some issues with the service design. As Giordano already said, um, a lot of households reported that they missed messages because they mistook them to be spam. And the reason for this was that the messages, particularly in the beginning, didn't have clear sender details, but just a telephone number and household associated or mistook this telephone number as a spam number and this uh, and therefore directly deleted the messages without reading them so clear sender details are really important to ensure that the, the messages are taken up then how to optimize reach and uptake based on our findings of course, first of all, make sure that there is a supportive infrastructure in place and that a large proportion of your target population actually can access and use mobile phones to, to get the service you're delivering. If this is not the case or if a, a large proportion of the target population is excluded, uh, alternative mode of delivery, in particular radio or community outreach might be more inclusive approaches or blended approaches. So this means, for example, radio-based programs that are followed up by mobile phone-based information delivery and so kind of leveraging different technology to, to share information and trigger behavior change. Then, of course, design the service to match the capacity of the target group. Text-based information is a really cost-effective um, approach to deliver information. Um, even to remote areas as long that, as there is kind of um, mobile phone uh, network connection. But voice-based messages might be better in areas with high levels of Ill illiteracy. Of course, there might be challenges with regards to taking up voice-based messages as we experienced in Ghana. So these need to be addressed. And voice-based messages are also much more costly to deliver. And then design features to help reach, to increase the reach and the uptake. Easy registration processes for the service are really important, preferably with some human contact and here in particular with trusted individuals such as health workers that can help to, to build the initial trust in the service and in the credibility of the information that is delivered, which is really important, especially if it's a purely mobile phone based service where there is no human contact after the initial registration procedures. And then also important in the case of Tanzania, we found this in particular, a short time period between the initial registration for the service and receiving the first information. Otherwise, people just um, forgot that they have signed up for the service at all. And this increased, of course, the risk that um, messages are disregarded or mistaken for spam for example. Over to Giordano. All right, so this slide is starting to show uh, our initial impact estimates for some of the main outcomes from the study. As Inc has already mentioned, the study, the quantitative study was based on a randomized control trial. So this is all going to be using variation that was experimentally varied by the research team. So it's showing for seven outcomes. So CDDS is going to be the child dietary diversity score, which is a count of the number of food categories that each child consumed from during the day preceding the survey. Whether the child met minimum dietary diversity or MDD is going to be an indicator variable equal to one if the child, if they reported that the child consumed from at least four of those seven categories. Similarly, we're going to have uh, dietary diversity measures for women. So whether the number of food categories that women consumed from during the previous day. And these are going to be the, these are going to be women who were either pregnant at the time of the baseline survey or had a child under 12 months of age at the time of the baseline survey. So the WDDS is going to be a count of the number of food categories that they consume from out of 10. And whether they met minimum dietary diversity for women is going to be an indicator that's equal to one if they consume from at least five. Then more intuitively, the, we had an, an infant and young child feeding practices knowledge uh, module in our questionnaire that asks questions of the women and their spouses about different practices and behaviors and what they should be doing around nutrition uh, in their homes. And so this is just going to be the percent of questions that either the women or the men answered correctly. And there were 20 questions in our inline questionnaire around this. And last, we have child height for age z-score. 
which is just the height of the child after standardizing using an international reference group of children that are growing at an appropriate rate. So the first column is going to show you the control group mean. So these are going to be children from households in villages that were randomly assigned to, the, to be the control group. The second column, or the ITT column, is going to show intent to treat estimates. This is, you can think of this as basically a minimally adjusted difference in the outcome between the treatment group and the control group, showing us kind of how tr treatment children or treatment group children compare to control group children. The late column, or the local average treatment effect column, is going to show us the impact of receiving, of actually receiving the messages for a group of households that were induced to receive the messages by the random offer of access to the program. And then the last, last column is just going to show you the number of observations. So the first thing to note is that we're actually going to find some modest positive impacts on men's knowledge of IYCF practices in particular, and then also on dietary diversity for, for both women and children. Okay. These are modest in size, at least in the intent to treat columns. When we scale them up by the difference in, in take up between the treatment and control group, which is what we do to get the, the local average treatment effect results, we're actually going to find reasonably sized effects there for some of those outcomes. So for example, for child dietary diversity score, the offer of access to the M Nutrition Program increased the child dietary diversity score by about 0.11 categories out of seven. Um, if we look at the late estimates, it's about 0.26. So these are not trivial in size, I would say. The, similarly, the percent of answers that men answered correctly is going to be about 1.7% higher in treatment households than it was in control households. We're not going to find any impact on female knowledge, which I think is in part going to be driven by two things. First, that females had higher baseline levels of IYCF knowledge, so it may have been harder to affect their knowledge base using the messaging. And second, as Inc has already alluded to several times, there were differences in access between men and women. So men had more access to the mobile phone, for example. So it may have been harder to reach the women in these households using the SMS messaging. But we're not gonna find any impacts on child height for HZ score. So it's gonna be a fairly precisely estimated zero, basically. That we find impacts on male IYCF knowledge and women's and children's dietary diversity but we find no impacts on child nutrition outcomes, suggests that the primary limiting factor for linear growth of children in this area is, is not likely to be information. So in resource constrained settings in particular, it may be necessary to combine information with resource transfers in order to affect the total resources that are available to households and enable them to act on their, up, their new information or their updated beliefs. Back to you. Oh, next slide, actually, Inka. So, there's a bit of a puzzle on the last slide, which was that we found impacts of the program on dietary diversity for women and children. And in a result that we don't show, we didn't find any impact on household dietary diversity. So it's not that the program is actually uh, causing households to go out and purchase or grow more diverse foods from which they consume from. It's just that they're shifting the way that they allocate the food across household members. When we look at impacts on total expenditure, for example, at the household level, we're similarly going to find no impact, which makes sense, right? It, doesn't make, it wouldn't make sense if we were giving these households information about nutrition practices, and, and we wouldn't expect that to actually affect the total resources that are available to the household. So what we do here is we're going to use a model of intra-household resource allocation. So to try and figure out if, we, if the programming is actually affecting how households are allocating resources across their members. When we do this, and we're still going to be relying on the random offer of access to this program to identify these results, we're going to find uh, suggestive evidence that the program actually increased the share of total household resources that were allocated towards children. Okay, And it's not a massive shift, but it's a pretty meaningful shift. So we're going to find that on average, children in control in treatment households received about 1.5% more of total household resources than children in control households. Where are these resources coming from? Uh, maybe unsurprisingly, they're coming almost exclusively from women. So the program it basically induced households to shift resources away from women and towards children. If we convert these effects into dollar amounts in, in 2000 US dollars, it's going to suggest that each child consumed about $70 more per year and females consumed about $113 less. So you can see this shift in resources from women to men. Um, we can use these kind of these resource shares 
and multiply them by total household resources, which as I've mentioned, were not affected by the program, to get measures of individual welfare for the household. When we do that, we find evidence that the program actually reduced childhood poverty. So for children that were between six and 35 months of age, they were about nine percentage points less likely to be living on less than $1.90 a day. Next. So while the main point of the, of the study was to explore nutrition outcomes and behaviors, we also had some fairly detailed modules on mobile phone use, which we felt were important because the, the SMS messages obviously are, dis, are disseminated through mobile phones. So one thing that we can explore, again, using the random variation that was generated by the evaluation design, is whether the program had any impact on mobile phone use among men or women in households, in the study households. And we're gonna find pretty strong evidence that the program did increase the use of mobile phones, uh, especially for females, but also for males. So women in treatment households, for example, were five percentage points more likely to report using a mobile phone to make uh, calls in the last 14 days, and six percentage points more likely to report having sent an SMS message in the last 14 days. Similarly, males are, are going to be six percentage points more likely to report having sent an SMS message in the last 14 days, although we don't see any impact on the likelihood that they use their mobile to make calls in the last 14 days. In part, this might be that 86 percent of the control males were reported using their mobile phones to make calls, so there was very limited scope to kind of affect that outcome. The last column here, so as a part of an expenditure module, we asked about household spending on mobile phones. So we might expect that if households are using their mobile phones more, that they actually have to pay more money to do so. And, and we do find evidence of that. Um, so households on average and tr treatment households on average spend about 500 uh, Tanzanian shillings more per month on mobile vouchers than, than control households. Next. Okay. Thank you. So what can we learn um, from this for increasing the effectiveness of mobile phone based inf uh, information services to change behavior? Um, we find that introducing interactive components such as call centers or active information searching informa functions was something households and mothers in particular very often mentioned in the qualitative interviews in particular and they said that would really this would really help them to to kind of in, stay engaged in the longer term and also promote behavior change as they for example have the opportunity to ask additional questions so as a conclusion we we kind of felt that it's important not to rely on just pushing out information to passive audience but kind of trying to integrate some interactive components in mobile phone-based services. Of course, this will also raise the cost for the service. Combine, and Giordano has already alluded to this, combine mobile phone-based services with financial services or other ongoing interventions that can help to address the underlying reasons for not changing behavior. And here in particular, poverty was mentioned over and over again. For example, combine mobile phone-based services to change infant and young child feeding behaviors with social protection programs that enable households to to act on the advice more in, in a bigger, um, like to, to a bigger extent. Users of mobile phone based services can only act on the information if they have actually the resources to do so. And then integrate information, so mobile phone based information services into existing programs and policies. And this is what Wazazi Nependeni has already done really strongly to kind of promote the uptake of local health services and this way reinforce and um, embed, reinforce existing knowledge and ultimately facilitate behavior change. How to design engaging content? We found that consistently among this, the user group that continued to engage with Vazazi Nependeni, so this subgroup of users that were reached and engaged with the service, the acceptance for the service was really high. Users perceived the, the service as useful, they found it easy to use, they trusted in the credibility of the information they received, and there were also no negative social influences that 
kind of had a negative effect on the uptake of mobile phone based information. Lessons learned for developing engaging content. We found that mothers and caregivers in general particularly valued practical low cost advice that is actionable and achievable. For example, a lot of mothers mentioned they really liked the information on how to prepare meat so that it's digestible for small children who don't have teeth yet. So hands on advice that can complement advice they got from health was, workers was really valued. Then mothers also praised the non-judgmental and supportive tone of the messages, especially as they felt that this was often different to what they experience in health facilities, where health overstretched health workers often um, were slightly just mantle and often blamed the mothers for um, poor performance in the nutritional status of the children. Introduce and strengthen two-way communication channels wherever possible, call center, any kind of interactive dialogues, and also remember that information is dynamic, especially mothers who already have a lot, several children were kind of engaging with the platform in particular if they needed to look for specific information to help them to tackle urgent problems that they hadn't experienced with their other children. So any kind of search function that enables users to actually look for the information they need at the time they need it might be a really a, a, valuable addition. Of course, this has cost implication for the service. Make sure that the service is tailored very carefully to the specific stage in pregnancy or early childhood. This is particularly important as poorly tailored messages can really quickly lead to disengagement with the service. For example, some women um, told us that they received, some women with young children told us that they received messages on pregnancies that were clearly not relevant for them any longer at this point in time. And they somehow started to doubt the, the, val the value and the credibility of the service overall. This is particularly important as there's no human kind of interaction to reinforce messages. And then intensive and interpersonal support is necessary for some skills and pr to develop some skills and to kind of enforce some practices. For example, breastfeeding. Messages can provide emotional support, they can provide further details on about practices, but they can't help users to develop the skills to do breastfeeding. And for this, they need um, local health or uh, local service providers such as um, health workers. And therefore, it's important that the service kind of links up with these existing services and also promotes uptake. Thank you and over to Nigel. Okay, thanks, Inka. Let me just see if I can um, get these, uh, share these slides with you now. So, the previous presentations have focused on the users of these mobile for development information services, looking in particular at how they've changed behavior and led to some kind of positive impact on development outcomes. In this presentation, though, we look the other way towards the companies and institutions that provide the services and consider the business and commercial arrangements that lie behind the scenes. Rather than focusing just on Wazazi Nipandeni and the M Health Tanzania PPP, in this section we've drawn lessons mostly from comparing and contrasting the two quite different case studies. So that's Wazazi Nipandeni and Vodafone Farmers Club. We're also thinking about this from a pro-poor point of view, given that the M Nutrition Programme was funded by DFID. First of all, let's see how the two services that we've studied compare with the rest of the M Nutrition projects. This slide shows that Wazazi and Nipandeni got the most users of any of the health-related services. And you'll see that five out of these eight services are led by a mobile operator, but Wazazi Nipandeni is one of the ones that is not. 
In contrast, this slide shows how Vodafone Farmers Club was the first of the agricultural services to get going. But growth in subscriber numbers was relatively slow and slower than expected. So at the beginning of 2019, the service was paused as Vodafone thought about how to revise their strategy. Note that while Wazazi Nipendeni was led by an independent provider, all of the MAGRI services were MNO led. So this gives us a fundamental and really interesting distinction between the two case studies. Okay, so how would we describe these business models? First, let's look at Wazazi Nipendeni. The government insisted that health information services must be made available free of charge, so there was no way of raising direct revenue from users. Instead, costs are met by donors and partner operators. This is similar to the multi-sided business models often used by tech companies, like Uber for example, which puts customers in contact with drivers. It's a little different in that users are not actually buying anything from funders, but we've argued that the funders with a health mandate actually get a benefit from improved health outcomes among users. This is effectively a business to business or B2B model because although messages are delivered to users, a lot of the public private partnership effort goes into field partners who are implementing health programs on the ground. And it's this community level presence that turns out to be really important. For example, registration data shows that over 80% of users may have been registered with the assistance of one of these partners. Vodafone Pharma Club is quite different. It's effectively a B2C model where Vodafone sells a service directly to customers. We've called it a partnership model here because different bits of the service are delivered to customers by both partners. Vodafone provides voice calls and deals with billing, while eSoccer delivers messages and provides a call center facility. Part of the original business plan was that uh, VFC would provide low cost product with lots of features to attract low income farmers onto the network. And this is why VFC was bundled as a SIM product. So it was designed to bring in airtime revenue from new customers as well as monthly subscriptions. In this slide, we've tried to summarize some of the key differences between the two case studies. We've already talked about differences in direct revenue, that uh, Vodafone Farmers Club targeted new customers, and that Wazazi Nipendeni integrated the service with field programs. So let me draw your attention to a couple of other points. Yeah. Firstly, who's in charge of the product? VFC was operator led. It was Vodafone branded. Vodafone made the pricing decisions, but they bought in the technical expertise from eSoco under contract. Wazazi Nipendeni on the hand, on the other hand, was driven by the PPP. They provided all the technology and most importantly, they made alliances so that the service could be made available on multiple networks. Next, VFC was a complex product. It wasn't just an agricultural information vas. It was also a SIM. Some calls were charged and some were free. And there was a call center where you could speak to agricultural experts in local languages. This meant that most customers weren't actually aware of all the features available. And it also caused some difficulties on the supply side. For example, some agents selling the SIMs didn't understand the features themselves. And some just sold VFC SIMs if it was all they had left. Another key difference relates to funding. As an operator-led product, VFC had to be commercially viable, generating either direct or indirect revenue in some way. On the other hand, was as in and Denny was donor funded, yet it still had to perform, but financial performance was not the bottom line. VAS business models rely on direct revenue, such as cash from subscription fees and or indirect benefits. And these usually revolve around increased market share, brand loyalty, reduced churn, increased expenditure on airtime. Given that Wazazi Nipendeni did not generate 
any direct revenue and neither did the Vodafone Farmers Club when the subscription fees were suspended for a period, this slide looks at indirect benefits. The quantitative study was able to show that Wazazi Nepandeni users spent more on airtime. A 10 to 20% increase represents a substantial and real financial benefit to operators providing the free SMS messages. The qualitative study was then able to unpack this a bit when they found that using the service helped women feel more comfortable using their phones. So they then made more calls, spending more money. One point to note is that uh, the VAS business model assumes consumers have a choice. So you can only reduce churn if people are regularly swapping providers. However, in many of the study areas, coverage was patchy and there was often only one network available. In these kinds of areas, which are typically poorer communities, consumers are effectively trapped into using the only network available. OK, moving on to costs. The quite different cost structures in this slide reflect the differences in the business models. For example, Vodafone Farmers Club is dominated by variable costs because sales agents were paid on a commission in sales and the contract with eSoco fixed a sliding scale of payments per user. Wazazi Nipendeni costs, on the other hand, are dominated by the cost of running the PPP, which includes the technical platform. If you're going to sell a service directly to consumers, that's B2C, especially those on low income, then minimizing costs is a top priority. So note that the costs of SMS was the largest single cost component for Vodafone Farmers Clubs and also the largest variable cost for Wazazi Nipendeni. So this raises an interesting and much argued point. What is the real cost of sending an SMS? Messages have been costed at retail prices in these charts, but it can be argued, for example, that the cost to Wazazi Nipendeni was zero because messages were donated by operators. Similarly, the real cost of Vodafone of sending messages is likely to be well below retail prices. The key distinction is that a third party led product will need to pay a real cost of bulk buying SMSs from operators, whereas an operator led product may be able to discount these costs internally. Supporting the poorest is always a challenge and this is true for SMS based information services as well. While SMS is cheap, it excludes those who can't read and local languages are an issue because people can struggle to read their local language in written form. Voice messages can overcome this, but they are much more expensive. In the study areas, many people struggle to find a reliable network connection. So there are still many people living in remote areas that can't be reached by mobile services. People with poor literacy will struggle with registering for services, especially anything that requires a lot of customer profiling information like the agricultural information services. They can also be risk averse and afraid of technology. And this is where having a presence on the ground really helps, but that's expensive. The qualitative study concluded that information alone is not enough to get people to change their behavior but also that people didn't have enough money to put advice into practice, which is obviously more of an issue for low income households. And finally, serving low ARPU customers makes it more difficult to generate both direct and indirect revenues, which underpin B2C business models. So learning from these two case studies, what can we say about viable business models? Customer acquisition is key. Any business model needs enough users to make it work. But the whole process of getting people signed up and registered is expensive and tricky. So this is where having the on the ground presence can really help. But a field presence can also do much more to help achieve positive changes in behavior. The technology platforms in both cases evolved through partnerships and investments over many years with Wazazi Nipendeni, for example, tracing its roots back over 20 years. Partnering with government bodies is an important part of this. 
The EFC only needed to get ministry approval of the messages, whereas several government agencies are active partners in Wazazi Nipendeni. But whatever the partnerships are, it needs clear product development leadership to make sure the product works for customers. It's interesting that the commercial model has been paused while Vodafone revise and consolidate their strategy, yet the donor-funded model behind Wazazi Nipendeni appears to contract, attract continuing support. At the end of the research, for example, the role of Wazazi Nipendeni was recognized in several health policy documents, and the main donor was exploring mechanisms for continuing donor support for the program, which has also extended into other mobile services all of which suggests there is a place for donor-funded models. Finally, a couple of concluding points. We should say that GSMA have already published a load of documents on all of the services supported by M Nutrition, and these include lots of learning points. But here we'd like to address a couple of threats, if you like. Firstly, mobile markets are shifting towards data and rich interactive services. This risks splitting any market between those who can access this kind of technology and those who can't. And secondly, as the money focuses on new database services, it's easy to forget about those areas that still struggle to get any signal at all. Wazazi Nipendeni represents one example of a free-for-use service, but other services in the M Nutrition portfolio provide further examples. We think this is a really interesting topic and the GSMA have already done some work in this area. And linked to this is a, another idea we'd like to throw in for discussion. Through the M Nutrition program, donor money has been used to develop a resource that we've shown generates money for mobile companies through increased ARPU. Can we find a mechanism for returning a share of that financial benefit to donors? Finally, when we started this work, a VAS provider explained they wanted to know if it was better for him to go with a mobile operator or to stay independent. Now we've shown there are pros and cons of both approaches, but when it comes to getting positive change amongst the poorest, evidence from these two case studies tends to, want to point towards third party B2B models, mainly because they provide a way of dealing with customers face to face. Right, that's, um, that's enough on the business modeling side of things. Um, so in this slide, I'd just like to sort of summarize some key points from all the different strands of the evaluation work that we've done. So a number of us actually said that we do recognize that mobile SMS services do, do indeed offer a low cost way of reaching large numbers of people. And the users do seem to really like the services, They're consistently giving them very high satisfaction ratings. But they work best when they're used to reinforce more conventional face-to-face -face interventions. Um, the studies also highlighted uh, different parts of the customer journey where users face particular challenges such as poor network coverage, registration, and then of course losing SIMs has been uh, identified as a major factor. And finally, mobile services uh, only really achieve positive development outcomes where they can contribute to uh, change behavior. And this is most likely to be the case where they're uh, integrated with other programs or services working on the ground. So um, at that point, I'd like to say thank you very much and I'll hand back to, um, oh, this is a slide just shows the, uh, the link where you can get more information, but I think that's been shared in the chat as well. So over to you, Becky. Thanks, Nigel. And thanks so much to yourself, to Inca and to Giordano for some really fascinating presentations there. Uh, yeah, just to emphasize that there is really a, a wealth of uh, uh, information that you can download from the link on the screen there. We've also been putting the links in the chat. I would, we've got a few questions that have come in already, but I would urge anybody to uh, submit any other questions that they'd like to, to um, ask the panel. Um, so a big question to start off with, which I'd like a sort of general reflection from all the panelists, from, from Tuzi, Edwin and Dekia. Uh, so with a lot of other nutrition related interventions going on in countries in, like Tanzania, how do you 
assess the effectiveness just of this program, just of M Health and nutrition. So how, when you're doing our evaluation, is it safe to say that it's just M Health, that M Nutrition just contributed to the results presented? Uh, Giordano, maybe we could start off with, with your team answering that question. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so good question. And I think uh, partly that's, we had to gloss over some of the details of the, the evaluation designs. Um, what we're doing here is we're re relying on a cluster randomized control trial. So basically we sampled villages for the study and then the research team randomly allocated half of those villages to be treatment villages and half to be controlled villages. In treatment villages, the households that took part in the baseline survey were randomly offered assisted registration basically for the, for the program. So we collected informa information from all households and then we offered to, to register for them for the service or to help them register for the service. So what we're gonna end up getting, what we're gonna end up estimating is the net effect of M Health. And the reason that we can say that is because the assignment of households and, and well, in particular of villages to treatment groups was controlled by the research team. So we know that access to other programming or um, child height for age, basically everything that we can observe and that we can observe should be balanced across the two treatment groups in the absence of the evaluation, okay? So that's gonna let us say what the impact of access to the M Health or M Nutrition programming was specifically. So I think that's it, that's an answer to that question. I don't know if, would you rather I wait to answer a related question? Uh, yeah, I think there's a couple of other questions that came in about the, the quant study. So if you could just stay on. And so the other questions we had were about the sort of design of the control group were, why did the control group get any M nutrition messages? And uh, so if you start off with that one, Joe, that would be great. Absolutely. So there's no way to, so we, it wouldn't be ethically appropriate or feasible even to try and restrict control of households from getting access, right? So this is a program that's freely available across the country. People could register if they wanted to. We, we had no uh, desire to kind of restrict that. Um, but the reality was that at baseline, and we saw this in our, in our survey work, uh, very few households were using the Wazazini Pandemi program in the region. Um, in part, that was because they had no existing partnerships in the region, which was partly why the region was selected. So we, we expected that baseline exposure to the program, while not zero, was going to be quite low. And that's what we found in our data. Um, so if you look at the, the end line data on exposure to the program or exposure to even more general nutrition programming, we're going to get self-reports uh, on exposure to SMS messages or the nutrition programming that are gonna suggest that the, the, the evaluation did successfully increase exposure to the program and exposure to M nutrition messaging and nutrition messaging more general, a lot by a lot more in treatment group households um, relative to control group households. You'll see that there are some control group households who report receiving the content and, and it's entirely possible that some of them were receiving the content. Um, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of our evaluation because we're gonna get identification off the difference in exposure to the program between those two groups, which we know was controlled by our experiment. So I'm just gonna give you a couple more uh, points, Gio, on the, the design of the quant study. And I would say that there's a lot of detail in the, um, both in the baseline and midline reports that are available on the IDS website, which will really go into a lot of depth about the study design. So just a couple more questions for you, Giordano which was, um, did your sample size enable any disaggregated analysis to look at differences between boys and girls in dietary diversity and other impacts? And what about younger and older children? So when we're looking at that impact on, on nutrition and health outcomes, did you manage to get any disaggregated analysis on that? So we, uh, I believe we've looked at disaggregated by the gender of children. I don't believe we found anything there. Um, but I don't hold me to that. I would have to actually pull up those tables and find, dig them out on, on my computer. Um, I would say for ages of children, so we very intentionally wanted to be able to expose households that had kids that were very young. And this relates to another question that I saw in the chat, which was about how we enrolled households in the study and enrolled them, uh, women in the study. So basically, we to be eligible to, to participate in the study, households had to have a, a member who was either a pregnant woman or who the mother of a child under 12 months of age, right? And that was very intentional because uh, our strong belief was that, ex and 
the belief of many is that exposure to uh, better nutrition during the first thousand days in particular might have a, an especially important effect on nutrition outcomes of kids. Okay, so uh, yeah, we, 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 there's not much age variation in our kids. They're almost all going to be between six months of age and 35 months of age. We could slip that age group up um, and look at differential effects by you know, slightly older and slightly younger. I would be skeptical that we would be able to distinguish between impacts on those two households. I can say that when we, what we have done is looked at, because there were two types of households that were enrolled, households that had a pregnant woman at baseline and households that had uh, a very young child at baseline. We don't see any differential effects for those two groups, um, but that's not explicitly doing it by child age. It's just gonna be something that's very correlated with child age. Great, thanks so much, Jadonna. That's really, really interesting. Um, so I've got a question that's come in for, which I think I'm gonna ask Inka. So talking about the dynamics in terms of intra-household resource allocation. So the, the look, so a question has come in from Charlotte Day about there's a big difference between men and women's decrease allocation and adults and children's change in allocation. So do we know how these decisions are made within the household and why are these two distinct differences? And a related question about um, the nutrition information that men had a lower percentage in their nutrition quiz results. So that relates to the fact that whether women have more knowledge of nutrition than men in these households. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, Becky, perhaps I can start and then the Quant team might want to add um, to both points. So with regards to the household allocation towards um, spending for, for the diets for the children, we find, uh, we found um, a very interesting use of the mobile phone based messages. Quite a few women in the qualitative work, these are just uh, women or mothers who engaged with the service for a sustained time. So throughout the entire intervention period or at least for a few months. They told us that they use the SMS messages to kind of strengthen their position in intra-households negotiation around um, spending for, for food. So a lot of women said that they kind of show the message content to their husband and said, well, the government tells us we have to feed the children, I, I don't know, a more diverse diet or we should feed them eggs on a regular basis. So we really have to, to follow this advice and kind of they use the, the mobile phone based messages as a kind of negotiation tool in intra-household negotiations. They, of course, got the same advice from the health worker in the health facility doing gross monitoring sessions or also doing antenatal visits. But the, the kind of ability to show the messages in intra-household discussions really was highlighted by quite a few um, women as a really strong negotiation um, instrument. And then um, Geo might might want to add um, more from the quantitative analysis there. And then with regards to um, women's knowledge, um, infant and young, chi ch young child feeding knowledge and men's knowledge. So what we found is that a lot of men told us that um, child feeding and caring for the children and also caring for the nutritional well-being of the household was really the, the women's task in their intra-household um, activity or task allocation and therefore they didn't engage a lot with um, nutrition information in general. So this might be the reason for why the nutrition knowledge of men was lower um, and then increased more because of the, the messages. But you might want to add. Thank you. Yeah, I can follow up on, on us and maybe start with that latter point first, uh, just to confirm exactly what Inc is saying is that um, we found at our baseline survey even that men had substantially lower knowledge of IYCF practices, which was entirely consistent with the, the qualitative work that Inc had just mentioned. Um, the program, the effect of the programming was to close that gap somewhat, but it persisted even at online. So even if we look at online, uh, women score higher on the IYCF uh, knowledge assessment that we included in the online survey. Um, in terms of Charlotte's question about intra-household resource allocation, um, so I'm not sure I entirely understand um, the question, but the idea is that 
we're, we're making an assumption that households are behaving efficiently. Basically, they're trying to maximize the welfare of the household and that there's no way to make one household member better off by, without making another household member worse off. Okay? Um, so when we look at how access to the program affected the allocation of resources across children, adult men, and adult women, the results are going to suggest that both adult women and adult men sacrifice somewhat to make the children better off, but most of the sacrifice was coming from uh, women as opposed to men. In terms of like the nuts and bolts about how that decision is made, we can't really speak to that based on the quantitative data that we have, um, but it does suggest that well, we, we can say that it, it does look like rather than affecting people's preferences over the types of goods that they would like to consume, what's happening is that uh, people might be getting a more general message about the importance of their children's consumption when they're young, and this shifts their tastes for their children's welfare, in, in effect. So like it makes them, it's not that they didn't already care a lot about their children's welfare, but this constant reminder that it's important to give your kids nutritious foods, it, you know, it can, it can lead to long-term differences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, may have led to this kind of salient effect where men and women really felt like they should be allocating more towards their children. And this is kind of what we see in the expenditure data. Back to you, Becky. Thanks. So we've got a question which I'm going to pose to the team at Gamos, to Nigel and Simon. Um, so it's from Steve Kingswell, and this is about the platforms. This is about the devices that people are using. So people are, uh, Steve has asked, to what degree was there an understanding of the mobile device types that the target audience were using? And was there an understanding of the mobile use patterns of the users? And I think this really talks to the issues that, are that came out, particularly, which you can read about in our uh, Lessons Learned report about the need to kind of adapt to emergent platforms uh, and the, the need to kind of diversify the kind of ways that we're communicating. Nigel. Yeah, thanks. Um, the the Wazazi Nip and Denny service is designed to be, uh, to, to be sent out over SMS. So in terms of platforms, you know, it's a very, one of the beauties of the system is it's very simple in its, in its delivery mechanism. And it is, you know, the mobile phone that can receive an SMS is the lowest common denominator, which again is a, is a way of ensuring you can meet the needs or you can reach uh, the poorest people in, uh, in these communities. So in terms of what, platforms being used it's just an sms system uh we don't know anything about the types of uh, uh handsets that users are actually receiving those sms's on as uh inca said earlier anyone in the country can sign up by themselves and they can receive the uh, wazazi nip and any messages so there's no particular pro poor targeting of the service um, so anyone, you know, elites, educated elites anywhere in the country can sign up and they can receive the messages on their smartphone if they wish, uh, but it's just the SMS. But what, one thing I, maybe I can just pick up on that point is about the difference in, in handsets. And we alluded to it very, very quickly in, the, in our presentation was that um, the way the mobile phone market is changing is moving over a lot more towards data, smartphones, internet services, social media, Facebook, all of that lot. Um, from the mobile phone company's point of view, there's a lot of money to be made there. And uh, that's the way the industry is, is, is moving. And that's where investors are particularly interested in. If that's where the money is, then that's where a lot of effort we suspect is likely to be concentrated over the forthcoming years. But we're we're aware that you know that's going to sort of uh, exaggerate this existing digital divide, if you like, that you, we find in countries where you've got uh, you know some people who've got all the modern technology and are well connected and like we've said on a couple of occasions that there are many people elsewhere in the country who struggle to get a very simple basic mobile phone signal and our fear is that 
as as we move forward, um, the market can get split between people who can access and want services that are available on the new internet enabled devices and those who are stuck using basic mobile phones and just getting SMS. And obviously that presents a, a financial challenge if you've got a split market. Um, so it'd be interesting um, to hear from the guys at the M Health PPP to know how they're, I know they are planning for that. They're fully aware of all that and it's interesting to know how they're going to address that. Thanks. Thanks, Nigel. And I think we possibly have uh, Salo from M Health PPP here. Is that right? Are you here, Salo? We can't hear him. Um, so while we're still waiting for possibly for an answer about that, we had another question um, about other sources of nutrition information which the participants are accessing. Um, Inka, I know this was something that I think we asked about uh, in, in the study. Uh, could you say a few words about that? Yeah, we, um, we asked about this in the qualitative work, but also in the quantitative baseline service, whether um, people have a reliable information or they perceive as reliable um, information sources about um, nutrition and infant and young child feeding practices. And um, the majority of households, both in the qual and the quant, said that they had reliable sources. And here, in particular, health services and, yeah, specifically antenatal care um, services that um, all mothers attended at least um, three times, or four times, I can't quite remember, according to the government guidelines. And then also later on, gross monitoring sessions in the community. However, um, the qualitative work looked a little bit more um, um, at the time mothers had to, to talk to health workers in the health facilities and also during um, gross monitoring sessions in the community and there um, kind of it emerged that often mothers had just really little time to ask specific questions. They usually just got kind of told what they were meant to be told by the guidelines and then the health worker had to rush to the to the next uh, mother or to the next child and another issue was that a lot of the discussions weren't really private so especially first time parents and mothers didn't feel comfortable to ask questions um, because they they felt they might be perceived as stupid or naive especially if um, more experienced mothers were in the health facility at the same time. So there were information sources, but um, the challenge was a little bit to, to ask questions, to get more in particular practical details. Um, other sources to, to conclude um, were the radio. A lot of mothers mentioned the radio and then also other experienced mothers. But here, the same barrier applied that especially first time mothers were often um, a bit reluctant or felt shy um, to ask questions. Yeah, thank you. There's some really interesting insights there from Inka about the um, limitations of offline advice and really great to hear that the trust that women had in being out in, in the SMS information. Uh, Saulo, are you free to say a few words now? If you could introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Saulo. I'm the senior senior program uh, uh, manager for the MWS Tanzania PPP yeah. program. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, partners who have uh, put together to implement this mm -hmm. comprehensive study. Uh, thanks to DFID for funding this uh, and other partners like GAMOS, I, IDS, OPM, uh, IFLI and GSMA for making this uh, uh, dream happen and be true. So uh, a lot of findings that I've, uh, I've been hearing here uh, on the presentation. There are some of these challenges we have been living with I like the network uh, coverage, you know, there are areas where uh, network, uh, mobile network operators are not reaching uh, those areas effectively, but also the mobile phone ownership. And uh, 
on the part of legislation, we have been struggling with the legislation uh, thanks to the feedback, I, I get the good feedback that we are perceived as easy to use service, but we have been working very hard to uh, reduce the steps on the registration, but also making sure that uh, we, may, we make uh, effort to reduce uh, the way the user interact with the service. When we started, there was as in Pendeni, uh, we were using uh, uh, ping pong. So ping pong meaning that you send a keyword uh, to a short code and then you wait for response. But when you wait for these messages, sometimes there's delays uh, of messages and then you frustrate the user uh, if uh, he or uh, he stayed a long time to wait for the response. So we changed to USSD. As you know, USSD uh, is uh, unstructured uh, supplementary saves data, which is used on the mobile money. So this is so uh, we have been uh, changing on this registration to make sure that it uh, makes uh, this happen. So I also agree that there are uh, those challenges related to retracy. Uh, we have been thinking of uh, deploying voice, but as you mentioned, voice is very expensive. So we have been uh, looking on different models and uh, looking on how we can teach those people who are currently not uh, uh, utilizing the, the service effectively. So like the call, we propose the call center, we have been looking to partner with other uh, partners who are using the call center to see how we can uh, use uh, the existing infrastructure to make sure that we can, use, uh, we can reach those people who are uh, not, uh, are not But in general, I would say uh, most of the key findings on this study uh, will help us a lot in improving the service. And we have already started working on, on, on some of the challenges that have been prevailed in this, in this study. So we'll, uh, we'll take this uh, key finding seriously as we try to improve on the implementation of the Wazazi independent, but also other, uh, other services that are, are coming in related to mobile. Thank you so much, Salah. That's really, really fascinating um, input and great to know that the, how valuable the evaluations have been for you. Um, just a, a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to aim this one at um, Nigel and the Gamos team. So does the panel think that if we understood the device types of each users, we could tailor, so there could be more tailoring of, of services? I know there's a lot in your evaluation about the value of doing things at scale. So his, the question from Simon is, uh, so rather than working to a lowest common denominator, work to a kind of segmented cohort model. So what do you think about the, the, the possibility and the value of doing that, Simon? So, Nigel, sorry. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting uh, suggestion, really interesting topic that uh, I think all of these operators are struggling with. Um, it was interesting chatting the other day with the GSMA. Uh, they reminded us that the M nutrition program was really conceived, and that was conceived some years ago now. It must you must remember. It was conceived as a way uh, of trying to uh, providing a mechanism for some of these information service providers to. To, to get to scale. So for many years, there's been many of these pilot programs going on with lots of different um, and very good services, but they all really struggle to reach the scale. And they also pointed out that with going to scale, there are a whole load of technical challenges. And they must, they, you know, they should not be underestimated. I mean, I think in the presentation, um, Gio pointed out that there were a number of people who said they were unaware of having received services. Okay, he gave some reasons why that might be, but we, we, we expect there are some technical issues there going on at the same time. So the, 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 the concept you, you know, you're putting forward is that we tailor to different users. And in principle, yes, that can be done. I mean, so for example, 
within Wazazi and Ipendeni service, all the messages are individually tailored to each user. So each pregnant woman that registers with the system enters the stage of pregnancy. And that from that point on, the messages that she receives are tracked and tailored to the stage of the pregnancy. And from after the birth, assuming that's a successful birth, the messages are specifically tailored to uh, the age of the child. So in principle, yes, it, it can be done. If there are different uh, registration details for different users and the type of handset platform that people are using, then yes, the, uh, the, the platform can distinguish and deliver different types of content appropriately. My reservation at this point in time is that that would require an extra and not insignificant step in the technology that's being used. So um, I think we're, uh, I may be, yeah, I think we're probably unlikely to see that in the immediate future, but it would be one way of getting around the, um, the, 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 the split in the market that I was talking about. Thanks, Nigel. So we've just got time for a, a couple more questions and I'm going to aim this one at um, Inca as a part of our expertise is in behavioral trains. This is from Juan Jimenez. Uh, so his question is, did the design process of this solution consider a behavioral change theory as a design principle? So for example, gamification or rewarding strategies. Thank you, Becky. Um, so well, to some extent, but of course it's important, I think, to remember that this service is kind of a, meant to be a global service that was rolled out in 12 different countries and kind of the underlying behavior change theory, I think, is um, is basically providing knowledge this will change um, attitude um, which then will lead to behavior change like the cup model whether there are any kind of more sophisticated behavior change theories underlying the design of the actual intervention I'm not sure and we didn't really find a lot of evidence for this um, so no so there were probably many kind of potential opportunities of how to do the actual behavior change component um, kind of more effective uh, with reward, with more interactive components, with, with other elements that kind of try to provide feedback, for example, to mothers that followed their advice and also allowing them to, for example, record or kind of keep some track of the changes they were implementing. But of course, this all would have increased the service costs. And this was meant to be a kind of sustainable model for um, mobile phone network operators. So, um, no, this is, um, yeah. So it's Nigel here. Can I just jump mm -hmm. in on that one as well, Inka? Yep. Yep, um, I was just remembering that, um, you know, the Wazazi Nipendeni service was actually way back in time. It was designed as part of, well, it was, it was, it, it came out of a behavior change communication program mm -hmm. that was being run in a number of different countries. And Wazazi Nipendeni was the component that was developed in Tanzania. So it was one of a whole range of communication initiatives in a, in a fairly well-funded program looking at um, uh, improving maternal outcomes. So, mm -hmm in way back in time you know it was designed as very much as part of a comprehensive communication strategy yep. which would have been rooted in behavior change theory yeah i think this it's really um, really great that you mentioned it nigel because this is actually kind of one of the strengths of wasazi nependeni that it's not a standalone intervention but an intervention that is embedded in the existing service and basically the same type of messages around infant and young child feeding but also maternal and uh, child um, care and health um, behaviors is kind of provided to mothers 
from different channels. And the literature suggests, of course, that if the same message is sent via different channels, the likelihood that um, it will be adopted is much higher. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we had a question in the Q&A about the model of SMS being from one Becky Fabian. Uh, about SMS being phased out and the data apps taking over. I think there's lots of detail in our um, reports about, uh, in the lessons learned report about the need for these, uh, as Inka was just saying, a, a kind of holistic models which don't just rely on um, mobile phone delivery, but supply um, information through other means as well. And also the need to not leave people behind by just using data-driven services. For, so that leaves behind people who are just using um, sort of basic uh, basic uh, feature phones. So there's one other question for Giordano. Are you, st are you still there, Gio? Uh, if you if it's possible for you to answer Kerry's question. Sure. Um, so Kerry, your your question is about what the late effects are. So it's it's not an as treated analysis. What what we're doing to estimate the local average treatment effects is we're using the randomly assigned offer of access to the program as an instrumental variable for whether people actually report that they received messaging from M Nutrition. Um, so this is, a, it's, it's called a local average treatment effect for compliers, because what, you're what you end up estimating is an average effect of access to the program, so actually receiving the program, for households that were induced to receive the program by the random offer, okay? And that's going to be different than an as treated because we're actually only using variation that comes from the random assignment. Um, we're a bit hesitant to overinterpret the late results because we're a bit concerned um, about the accuracy of the self-reported exposure measures. Um, but in theory, that's what late will get us. It will get us an average effect for a subpopulation, um, and it's not as treated. It's all using experimental variation. Hopefully, that answers your question. Thanks so much, Gio. Um, as I said, lots of detail on the quant research and the qual research and the business model in the, the scientific reports, which you can download from the link on your screen. And we're just going to have a couple of words from Inca before we close. But before we do, just I wanted to say thanks to everybody for a really great panel. And thanks to all our speakers. Over to you, Inca. Okay, thank you very much also from the entire evaluation team, of course, um, for joining the webinar. So kind of to conclude, as we said already, we don't think that mobile phone based information services are a magic bullet to change infant and young child feeding behaviors. And there are still some programmatic and implementation, implementation issues that need to be addressed. And we are aware that GSMS, GSMR is already working on a lot of these issues. But nevertheless, we, we strongly believe based on the evidence that we gathered in the evaluation that there is a potential for mobile phone based services and changing infant and young child feeding behaviors, especially if the service is embedded in existing services to reinforce messages and also to kind of enable um, mothers and families to act on the information. If there is some kind of human component integrated in the mobile service that allows interaction and um, if the underlying reasons um, for not acting on advice are um, addressed, for example, by in great in integrating the program into social protection program or combining it with financial services. So thank you very much. And please have a look at our um, reports and especially the lessons learned brief that you can find um, free of charge for download um, on our website. And also feel free to email the evaluation team if you have any further questions or um, want uh, further information. Thank you very much.